know, sort of the, the, the transition between the uh, formal program development going through uh, as the uh, Commission uh, on Sustainable South Florida to uh, basically a segue into how to apply the things that we've all been talking about to an actual piece of ground. Uh, and so this uh, presentation that we're starting off with now by Elizabeth Taylor-Dugger will uh, begin the translation uh, of the discussion into the, the, the real world. And I think uh, it will begin something that uh, I think we will all enjoy uh, going through together uh, and it will together gain a greater appreciation of the fact that uh, you really can't separate uh, land, water, uh, and critters uh, from the, uh, the resources of management process that we have to look at uh, all in one piece. Uh, it, uh, it's sort of humbling standing up here introducing uh, Elizabeth Hunter Zyber. Uh, I think South Florida doesn't really appreciate uh, how fortunate we are in having people uh, at the really at the, the, the cutting edge of this uh, idea of the notion of land use uh, resource planning. Uh, Dr. Grove, uh, Elizabeth, uh, under 20, and uh, the younger generation coming along, represented by Joe Fabrizio Dover and Joe Cole, uh, that uh, are really literally in the national and international forefront uh, of this understanding of the relationships uh, between uh, the planning of land uh, and creating places, uh, livable places for, for people and, uh, and critters. Um, we were in a meeting this morning, and, and one of the uh, uh, people in the meeting took offense uh, that uh, you, somebody might have referred to humans as animals. And we sometimes forget that, uh, in fact, we are. Uh, and uh, we all fit into this uh, landscape together. <coughs> There's a very important understanding that uh, I think that, that uh, people like John, Elizabeth, and Chris, uh, Victor, and Joe have come to put before us and help us. Um, we as a state tend to underappreciate uh, this group, uh, and uh, the world, in fact, uh, uh, has recognized their uh, abilities and contributions. And Time Magazine has called this number as the designers of the decade, or designers of the decade, or something of that sort. And it, it was also brought home to me uh, one evening uh, uh, having wine. Or this was this. Trying to help uh, my, my wife and I understand how to remember our house on the table because she's a girl, a lawyer. So it was a dangerous way to start a conversation. Um, can you tell us about the uh, things that, what, what we would be able to talk with her about at dinner? Um, and it turns out she was going to be having dinner. She and I uh, the recipients of the Thomas Jefferson Award by the University of Virginia, uh, along with the uh, Chief Justice. And it's that kind of, uh, of recognition that uh, the, the people receive that we all appreciate here in South Florida because you know, they're right here among us. So I hope that uh, uh, you will, uh, I'm in fact certain that at the conclusion of this, you will agree that uh, they're a resource that we should uh, uh, treasure and uh, work with uh, uh, even more in the future. Uh, so uh, having said that, let me simply uh, introduce a little bit uh, encourage you to uh, uh, sit back, uh, think, and have fun. Thank you, Pat. Can everyone hear me? Um, so, a very nice introduction. Yeah. And um, I guess one way of saying that we've been doing a lot of work uh, in other places besides South Florida in recent years, um, and that is true. Uh, but I think what it uh, what it does for this group here in the next couple of days is that um, because of that, we are bringing to this event in this effort um, lots of information, I think, from other places, things that are being tried elsewhere or um, have failed, succeeded, and so on. And, um, so whenever we do have the opportunity to work locally and bring some of the ideas that other people are having success with in other places, um, we really feel very privileged and proud to thank um, you, Matt and Dan, South Florida Water Management, South and Friends of Florida, uh, and the government.
Governor's Commission for giving um, us the opportunity to work with you all in the next couple of days and certain months. And I should say that the um, supporting group that Sam mentioned, um, Bill and Cole and others, and uh, I would mention uh, uh, certainly a number of other people locally, like Dan Williams, who's doing a fine project with South Florida Water Management. Uh, but there really is a wonderful group of um, people working both in uh, civic or, or um, public sector agencies and the private sector, uh, normally we're called consultants, um, in a kind of intensity of effort uh, which we spread to other parts of the country from here. Uh, and uh, as I was going through the lecture and deciding what to show you, I realized uh, we really have kind of a uh, very intense group of people that is wonderful to work with. And I think it can be very productive. So we have a lot of things going from the people resource uh, point of view. Much of my talk will be lectures, and I was dismayed when I walked into the front of the room to see that there's a big aisle uh, just beyond the first four rows, which is separating you from the slides. And I would uh, recommend that everybody who's in the back to move up front. I know that sounds like um, we're in church or something, but uh, I assure you that as soon as it gets dark and I start talking to the slides, I can't see you anyway. So if you leave early, it won't be embarrassing. <laughs> uh, but I think you'll enjoy whatever part you stay for a lot more if you're closer to the end. Excuse me. Hopefully we can help you get there. So this talk proposes 
that the design of the built environment and the natural systems that support it must be made part of the public agenda, up there with crime and tax reductions. I used to say crime and health care. <laughs> I say this as the illusion. I know the topic is way behind in public awareness, but if it's time to, but it is time now to acknowledge the importance of the physical environment in structuring behavior and the quality of life for all members of society. In the U.S. today, as the city sprawls, you find yourself to be among the most segregated by color, age, and income societies in the world. Urban sprawl consume our resources at rates that, besides damaging the natural environment, is threatening to decant the core of many of our cities and towns to nothingness in a matter of years. We are wasting our cities as well as our landscape. Our core urban areas are neglected to a point which exacerbates the prejudice, the prejudice against the disadvantaged who live there. The suburbs have replaced the cities as the place of municipal and private investment. And these have failed to engender the necessary sense of community and responsibility among the advantaged, who in a more physically integrated situation could be the host rather than the nemesis of the needy. Such is the social impact of recent growth. Although our state has not yet reneged on its commitments to growth as a whole, or on its commitments to hospitality to immigrants, rich and poor alike would agree that the impact of the last 30 years of growth in South Florida has been little short of disastrous for both our physical environment and our quality of life. And by physical, I mean natural and built. This audience and our workshop sponsors do not need to be reminded of the environmental component of this picture. Uh, we are going to hear a lot about that in the next couple of days. And although we will only be addressing it indirectly, the economic component parallels. South Florida is a region gifted by its geography and history. Yet even with an appealing climate and location, and a good share of nationally important infrastructure, airports, seaports, rails, and highways, the region cannot overcome its standing as among the poorest and least productive in the nation. Being able to boast a high per capita ratio of gardeners cannot be a blessing when we cannot keep up with schooling their children. And a regional cash flow in which entitlements preempt trade and tourism certainly betrays <coughs> an economic imbalance. So in the midst of this seemingly intractable news, let us look at how restructuring the physical environment might be the key to numerous problems we confront today. Environmental degradation, traffic congestion, financial depletion, social isolation, and yes, even crime. Perhaps in the same way that we have learned that our natural environment will only survive through a restoration of essential interactions, we can also look to centuries old and universal forms of urbanism to see what best serves the human ecology, those other animals. Understanding, of course, that the proposed form will not mimic exactly its predecessors, nor will it be totally independent of technology. So with this parallel in mind, let's look at a regional picture of South Florida. The goal of a sustainable future has probably been least addressed and is potentially most rewarding at this scale of the region. It is the middle scale of action between state growth management laws on one hand and municipal and household efforts to conserve energy and recycle on the other. A level of collective action at which some issues can only be addressed. Environmental issues such as climate, natural resources, habitat, and water. Infrastructure such as transportation, waste, energy. Social equity, the balancing of resources for education and housing. And even, and even economics. That complex picture which is changing um, uh, from, to knowledge working, from industrial working, as Peter Drucker puts it depends on a complete and balanced picture of all of the above. <coughs> so we start with slides, please. <coughs> I need to bring the lights down.
all probably seen slides like this before. Um, this is a historic drawing of a vegetation map of southern Florida on the left, and of course the satellite aerial on the front. Uh, and uh, probably everyone in the room far too well knows the changes that have occurred going from like that. Uh, we understand that doing too much of what's on the left slide, uh, urban sprawl, uh, and this kind of physical growth is a large part of the problem uh, that's being dealt with uh, uh, by the sponsor groups and in this workshop. Um, on the right, we have a photograph of another part of the world, that's Germany, uh, and the one on the left, of course, is South Florida, uh, which shows that many people have been struggling with these um, somewhat more successfully and under different prototypes in other parts of the world. Um, I really, I use these two slides as a kind of <coughs> contrast. We may not be able to um, act in the same method that European countries have uh, for many centuries, but the fact of the matter is, and I will not talk very much about Europe at all after this because I know we're all sensitive to the fact that it's a different situation, but the fact of the matter is that um, already for a long time, uh, Europe has been uh, dealing with um, a limited land mass and limited resources, uh, and they have been husbanding, husbanding their resources wisely. Uh, we never thought we had to until recently, uh, and probably what we will aim for is some kind of hybrid. Uh, but that thinking about development and the natural environment, the ultimate scale of urbanism, the organization of infrastructure, and so on. Um, is not something even in the United States that uh, is new, although for many of us we think we're breaking new ground. Um, since the turn of the century, uh, a number of efforts have been um, going in direction from uh, Ebenezer Howard's English um, book, Garden Cities for Tomorrow, which influenced uh, many of our own um, new terms like Carl Gable. Uh, to Benton Mackay's work, which is illustrated with that map of Massachusetts on the right, uh, in uh, a book published in 1923, he proposed a theory uh, of green limits to stem the flood of the metropolitan growth, uh, in which uh, all of those dark stripes. All of these uh, are to be are suggested preserved areas. Uh, uh, around which might be organized uh, physical growth. Uh, at the same time, uh, there were people like Clarence Perry looking at the social component, um, structuring an ideal neighborhood uh, in the 20s, Louis Mumford looking over his shoulder. Uh, and this thinking uh, continues in the work of people, other people in the country, like Peter Calcourt, um, with this diagram of Portland area showing uh, transit oriented development, uh, which is clustered notably around infrastructure, using open space in the 20s. And probably some of the most advanced work, which has been ongoing for some time, is in the greater Toronto region. Uh, very similar when you map it, I think, uh, to the Benson and Pie drawings from over 70 years ago, uh, in which green areas, uh, primarily drainage ways, are to be preserved. Uh, and one natural escarpment, uh, as shown on this drawing. And a study which has been going on for some time, uh, looking at the cost of um, uh, these different methods of growth, uh, which they call grid, central, and nodal, looking at what it would take to uh, encourage growth to cluster back in towards the center of Toronto, or what it would cost to continue sprawling as they have been doing uh, with very good planning, by the way. Uh, and finally, what that hybrid uh, of nodal um, development, in which one might begin to focus on a series of centers, um, uh, might cost. And in the end, the conclusion was that the nodal um, method is preferable. Now, all of those places and those efforts may seem far away um, mm -hmm. from us. And so I thought it would be useful to just review a little bit of the history of the settlement in Florida um, to see what is close to home that we might learn from. Our history has been usually chronicled to emphasize the exploitation of land and unsuspecting visitors. 
still, we have some good precedent from which we can learn today. And I'm showing you, of course, a picture of uh, Winter Park on the right, uh, which follows many of the principles of Wise Earth, which I'll talk about later, uh, and continue to be very successful in town. Uh, and on the left is a picture, uh, an early plan for that by John Nolan, who designed many of our wonderful communities, uh, including his plan for Clifton, uh, which shows uh, a resort community along the water, along the bay, um, with uh, another settlement inland here, uh, a drainage way protected, as you can see by the lines around that stream, and then farmland all around. So this is already, this drawing is already beginning to look a little bit like the German model that I showed you in that very old line. Uh, and Nolan as well had wonderful ideas for um, our city, uh, like his early plan for Sarasota, some of which remain intact, um, with a public waterfront, uh, and even smaller, um, as we might call them, subdivisions, smaller communities, uh, which very clearly delineate quite a clear vision uh, of how the natural environment and the built environment might interact. Uh, and even places that we think are unplanned, like um, the courthouse town uh, of northern Florida, like Monticello on the left, uh, which has the courtyard courthouse at the beginning and the center of the square around which are aggregated shops, residential neighborhoods beyond that, uh, or Key West, uh, where Uses mix very easily different types and sizes of housing, um, uh, shops such as here, the shop below the apartment above, uh, on streets that are very comfortable for the pedestrian, uh, as well as providing particular access. Places that have become quite valuable, like Coral Gables, um, and even less wealthy places like Micanopy, uh, which is a small town in the north. So we really do have a number of models that we can look to. Um, but since those models were built or begun, um, something has happened. And the exploitation uh, aspect indeed seems to have won out. And so where all of the models I've shown you were uh, built on principles that we would call traditional urbanism, uh, an interconnected street network, uh, a commercial focus at the center, mixing of uses, and housing types. We now have a different model. After World War II, uh, we developed a model of pods and separate uses, uh, which load up our steel roads. Uh, even the school cannot be walked to here. Uh, and we know what that looks like. Um, this is not a slide of the area we're going to be looking at, actually, uh, tomorrow, but it's very close to it. Modern urbanism, based on this suburban model, focuses on personal mobility. It gives priority to free and rapid flow of traffic, to convenient parking in large quantities. It's evident in the suburban model's rigorous separation of uses and its inherent incentives for new building rather than maintenance and rebuilding. That may not seem to be particularly important in a place like this where uh, there may have been only a farmhouse to save, but this model has been transferred to our cities and is part of what's been as we very easily take down old buildings, thinking that the new are always better. And the characteristics of this model have been institutionalized into federal policy, banking regulations, local zoning ordinances, and public work standards, almost universal, of course, not just in South Florida. Mm -hmm. So today's suburb is organized uh, and separated into isolated pods dedicated to single use, such as you see here. Um, and of course, once you uh, once you set up the system, uh, and you have only a few large roads that load up with lots of traffic, then of course you really need to begin to separate um, the, de the development around it with buffers, walls, and so on. These are all slides from South Florida. Probably you've been there. Vehicular traffic controls the scale and form of public space with streets usually being extremely wide and dedicated primarily to the automobile. Uh, in this slide, you can't even get to this school on foot. Um, there's an interrupted sidewalk, there are canals, there are all sorts of buffers that prevent you, uh, and all you can do is drive. <coughs> Through traffic 
can use only a few collector streets, which immediately fall prey to traffic jams and congestion. Buildings are separated from the street and from each other in a manner which precludes the geometric definition of public space and any possibility of making a sense of its life. In public buildings, such as this school, do not receive distinguished sites being relegated to the strip. There is no civic focus for any increment of population. Uh, so how do we get from here to there? These are slides um, uh, of drawings for Marion County um, being engaged to do the land use element for the comprehensive plan, which we did not do very successfully. Um, we were given a drawing like this by the city, this is El Palos, by the county, which said, uh, given the projected infrastructure growth, we anticipate that our suburban development will look like this by uh, the year 2005. Uh, and everyone looked at this with some trepidation. Uh, and we produced a plan saying, well, wouldn't it be wonderful if we could contain the growth in many of the places that it already exists? Uh, and then project some way for new growth uh, in the other areas that would not destroy the most beautiful county uh, in the state. So, of course, the question is how do you do that? Uh, and we produced a, a rather complex formula of clustering that would not take away uh, any uh, property rights, any density, in fact, um, but it still became quite controversial. Uh, but the principles relied on, um, and I'm going to be showing you a series of diagrams that we work some of these ideas through, uh, on taking an existing city uh, or region and saying, uh, in order to preserve as much of the open space uh, for natural uh, conservation or farming, um, there are really two methods to do this. Uh, and that is the work of whole neighborhoods, uh, which I will describe to you. Uh, infilling, first of all, the city, not taking it apart, uh, but infilling it um, uh, in such a way that it's uh, once again self supporting, uh, and making new additions only as whole new communities, uh, in, uh, which are, I hate to use the word sustainable, that's really not the issue, but uh, that are holistic in terms of providing uh, services and makes them new system types. Uh, existing rural villages might be expected to infill and expand in the same way, um, and new villages uh, or new settlements would only be allowed along existing infrastructure, whether it's along rail lines or existing roads. It seems simple. Uh, and of course, the drawing on the right um, shows that instead of growth parcel by parcel, use by use, uh, one might take all of these uses into one, one community or neighborhood. Yeah. Uh, in that way, um, with the goal of using three elements, neighborhoods, districts, and corridors, uh, to begin to form uh, a whole body, uh, a whole city. Uh, and for a long time, we were talking only about neighborhoods as that most vital increment of urban growth, uh, which had a defined boundary when yeah. we and therefore serves urban as well as natural purposes. Um, but more recently, we've understood that there are two other components, and we think this is it. Um, because besides these neighborhoods, which are mixed use compact, citizen friendly, and transit oriented communities, you also need <coughs> single use districts, uh, which might be, of course, places like the airport, um, the commercial or the business district of a um, quite an intense city. The industrial yard around the railroad terminal or a port, um, a campus, uh, and so on. <coughs> and then the corridors are, um, of course, uh, any number of things that both connect and separate uh, districts and neighborhoods, whether they are uh, roads, rails, um, greenways, or green belts, um, as you see here with the catalogs. Neighborhoods come in many shapes and sizes, uh, but you'll see they're all, always uh, of a certain size. Um, districts serve several different purposes, um, and these corridors can be um, a number of things infrastructure or um, And 
the song may seem uh, uh, extremely elementary, but um, we spent a lot of time actually trying to make things that simple because we believe that the picture that you're working towards has to be extremely clear and simple. It's never going to end up being that way. Uh, but if you don't start out that way, you won't get anywhere close to it. So once again, here's the model that in turn, in turn uh, instead of growing endlessly and taking apart uh, the core city, uh, one might uh, intensify its health at the same time uh, that growth occurs in this node, node pattern, uh, much like the Canadian study. Uh, and these things, of course, um, uh, can be any size. Uh, the neighborhood and aggregation of neighborhoods, we're saying, um, of course, districts and cars, but an aggregation primarily of this primary component will give you anything from a series of small rural hamlets uh, to larger villages, towns, and, and of course, you know, the kind of city that was on the prior diagram. Um, so, what is a neighborhood made of? Uh, and this is a newer version of that other uh, diagram. Now, this is what we saw up on the bottom. Um, this is the neighborhood at the top, the five minute radius. And I'm going to uh, list five rules for making a good neighborhood. The neighborhood has clear boundaries and central focus. This contributes to social identity. These boundaries may be natural, um, one of these corridors, a green belt, golf courses, or they may be infrastructure, a highway or a rail. The focus is an urban space, a green or a square or a main street, with public institutions adjacent, such as a neighborhood hall, a daycare center, a general store, a transit stop. The neighborhood's telecommuting center can serve as a functional for home workers as well. Uh, and of course, this is the New England village, which does all of those things, including it has a green boundary. Um, I don't have a similar aerial of a place in Florida, unfortunately. I think it makes everything fine. The basic dimension of the neighborhood is a quarter mile radius, roughly a five minute walk from center to edge, which places daily conveniences such as store and the bus stop within walking distance of everything, of every resident. Focusing the residents in such a compact manner makes transit again viable. Uh, it's not necessarily just the low density that we're building at that makes transit impractical. It's also the fact that we're not focused uh, to receive it. But the elderly and youth gain independence as well. This scenario of compact urban development also allows for energy saving strategies like co-generation uh, or district cooling, which European cities and towns have used for decades. Of course, they use districts. The neighborhood makes its uses within a close proximity uh, and in small increments. This encourages pedestrian activity, reduces the number and length of automobile trips, thus minimizing traffic congestion, pollution, and the expenses of road construction and maintenance. <laughs> If cities were designed so that even half of every household's daily vehicular trip, now calculated in some parts of South Florida as 13 trips a day, if even half of these could be carried out on foot, by bicycle, or by transit, vehicular traffic could be reduced virtually by 50%. And the mixing of uses also encourages a number of strategies for affordable housing, such as apartments above shops, garage apartments with single houses. Um, land close to this commercial district, the first couple of tiers of residential property are less expensive and stuff further out and so on. But the single most effective means of increasing the supply of affordable housing could be the neighborhood's ability to decrease dependence on the automobile. One less vehicle owned by today's modern income household could liberate roughly $5,000 a year to cover an otherwise inaccessible mortgage. Four, the neighborhood has a network of frequently interconnecting streets and public spaces designed for the comfort of people rather than vehicles. Public space is a civic realm and represents the identity of the community. That's why we say there's no there there and so much um, in so much in suburbs. We have no public space, we have no public realm. It's the physical manifestation of that political goal of the public good. Neighborhood streets and squares are laid out to make pedestrian routes short and extremely safe. This encourages walking and the casual meetings among neighbors which form the bond of the community and which engender caring for collective security, uh, not to speak of personal health. Community police.
hopefully things can occur that does on foot with a dog or horseback as well. And that's a whole different security picture. Uh, and here is where the where details get important. In fact, I think in everything that I'm talking about, there's a level of detail and precision that's very important. But I'll just mention uh, with regard to this one that uh, we currently have standards in South Florida that require, uh, even on local streets, a 35 or 45 foot turning radius at intersections. Uh, if you think of the photographs before, and you see what kind of street this person is crossing and how close that distance is, uh, which is illustrated on the right, then you can see that the crossing distance for a pedestrian at an intersection like this becomes two or three times what it needs to be for them. Uh, and it also facilitates car movement through the intersection. So the cars sometimes don't even have to slow down very much if they have good visibility. This is a problem for everyone, but it thinks particularly of children, older people, and the handicapped uh, in that situation. And finally, the neighborhood plan gives priority to the appropriate location and design of civic buildings to embody the community image and to foster civic pride, as well as to encourage citizen participation neighborhood activities and governance. Schools of the community focus are especially important today when they are being asked essentially to function in local communities, even in the wealthiest communities. Um, and school size is an issue that um, probably we'll be talking about tomorrow. Uh, and of course, in Dade County, school location is a critical issue right now. Um, that's a long story that I won't go into. Now, um, all of that may seem fine when you're looking at historical prototypes like I just described, or when you think of a new place where you can do all of those things. Um, but in fact, um, we've taken a look for some time now at different parts of the existing urban structure, and we think all of those principles are actually applicable to the whole gamut of built form issues. Uh, and this is a diagram which is in process. Um, we still haven't corrected it to the degree that we want to. Uh, but in this, on the bottom, that there are really five kinds of urban situations that we have to deal with. And this is an issue uh, uh, for uh, the environmental picture, because as we know, if we don't um, work with the existing core urban areas, um, we will continue to be expanding uh, forever and ever into the areas that we don't want to. This is just kind of American uh, when you don't like the way things are going here or here, you just keep moving further out. Uh, and these five areas, um, going from the outside to the inside out, let's say, are the core city, um, like that first diagram I showed you, the city by itself. Um, the inner suburb, uh, which is this area, which grew along lines of infrastructure uh, from the turn of this century to World War II, along roads, uh, and railroads. The outer suburbs, um, this lighter yellow area, which filled in when the ring roads came in uh, and uh, has been building out since the 50s, 60s, and 70s. Um, the new edge, uh, which goes beyond these outer roads, and I think we're in a new edge right here in Bond Metro. Uh, and this is kind of 70s uh, and 80s and 90s phenomenon. <coughs> and then finally, uh, rural expansion. Uh, it's way out there uh, and uh, sometimes uh, even destroys the heart of the town as that expansion occurs. And I'd like to show you, um, I'm sure you can picture all of these places in your mind, uh, one by one as we go from the outer part of the rural area back to the core city, how some of these neighborhood strategies uh, might be applied uh, to make a better urban environment more appealing and condensed or consolidated urban environment uh, so that we can really begin to work uh, with preserving open space. Uh, this is a drawing from Loudoun County, um, Virginia, a place which instituted a, a, a rural village code because they were very concerned uh, surrounding historic villages like this. Uh, this is Waterford, which is a very picturesque uh, 
country town. Uh, the kind of large lot public acquisitions which were beginning to come in uh, one by one in a disconnected fashion. Uh, and it was understood early on that this would be destructive to the future uh, of this village. Um, this drawing, which is hard to see, this row here, this one, uh, as the second row here, and a cut through there, it begins to duplicate, in effect, um, the existing village fabric. Uh, instead of bringing in a totally new one, uh, so that it can grow according to its existing character. Uh, a project that Bill Cole uh, uh, worked on in Carolina uh, shows very clearly, and I'm not sure how far back you can see this, the kind of um, sprawling large lot suburban development uh, that might be allowed within um, some natural boundaries with, of course, a commercial Center, a shopping center at one end. And this drawing, this is unfocused from here, I don't know if it's a little bit I need someone in the back to be focused on the front. I can't see that far, so I don't know what I'm talking about. Nobody can see anything. Okay. Um, that those plans should be overlaid in a, in a 
by the municipality. Um, however, it was determined that the uh, that the planning staff or the permitting uh, authorities uh, could, in fact, encourage the complete build out uh, of a place designed as thoroughly as this um, through the timing of permitting. So that if you came in and followed the plan, you were a property owner, and let's say in this one, you only had a piece of the property, but you came in to fill out your uh, property according to this plan, you would get permitted in a matter of weeks uh, or very few months. Uh, and through a series of grading in, in detail, if you did nothing else uh, except connect uh, from one center over to the next one, uh, this degree of detail or conformity to plan, of course, could take about three years. Uh, but I will speak more about implementation issues at the end. Uh, now, one of the best known examples, of course, of new edge building, um, according to the name of the principles, is of course Seaside, uh, an aerial view taken about a year ago, and a shot of the code, um, which it turns out was some kind of breakthrough because uh, it proposed that one might uh, build out a community like this, not with the usual abstraction. Are, um, uh, and so on, uh, but with uh, much more of a physically oriented building type code. It deals with all of the same issues, uh, setbacks, heights, and so on, uh, but it's very particular about the image uh, of public space and buildings relating to it that it seeks. Uh, it's not style specific, uh, as many people say, it's not just the style, but it's really about the urban spaces that are made by buildings. Uh, the shops below, offices, and apartments above that, uh, and as well, um, how you make a public space with cars and people mixing. Uh, and it's very much about uh, these public spaces being formed by the private building uh, with a great priority on public access to amenities. Um, this was very unusual for its time, beginning in the late 70s and early 80s. There's not one gated entry. Um, there's not a series of high rises or townhouses close to the space along the coast. Uh, and of course, it's been a great hit. Um, it's also been very kind uh, environmentally. Part of the concept uh, not only was about energy conservation and building, um, making of community, and so on. There was a great deal of concern taken with the natural environment in dunes, for instance. Um, and this is a very recent photograph of uh, one of the streets in Seaside uh, here on the uh, which shows how even um, uh, some of the natural growth, which of course is very stunted and low along that coast uh, because of winds from the sea, um, has taken on a whole new aspect and a kind of help um, with the protection of buildings. And we understand there's a new kind bird life which exists now, which didn't before. Of course, people say seaside is a resort, it doesn't count, um, but we can point to several other places, uh, uh, which really now count because they've been up for several years, there are market statistics covering them, such as this one near Washington called Kentland, um, in which clustered around an old farmhouse, historic garden, and um, the farm pond, uh, among its many neighborhoods, one which does a very thorough mixing of large homes like this one with its garage apartment and a series of smaller townhomes um, which are here at the end of the street. Uh, and what this had did was that it opened the door uh, for a number of other communities uh, and in fact I think encouraged Montgomery County to come up with an affordable housing law which requires now every new uh, housing project to be built to include, um, I think, 10% of affordable housing. And so this is a sister project to Kentlands, which has uh, within this cluster of the first dozen or so homes, prices ranging from 77000 to 250000 uh, And that's always been one of the bugaboos of urban marketing, uh, saying that that's something that you can't achieve. Well, it's happening. And one reason that it's happening is because it's in the law and the playing field is level, everybody has to do it, it's really simple, and believe it or not, people buy it. Um, next to this house, I can't see the price, 185, uh, are the 
the two our two townhouses, uh, one of which is sold for 77, uh, and another one which the housing authority has purchased to rent for very low income. Uh, so steps are being made. Um, there are all sorts of um, uh, and environmental um, issues that we could be talking about. This is Windsor, which is in Hero Beach. I'm just trying to find <coughs> some more projects, um, uh, which is following a, a very um, particular Caribbean model, which exists in St. Augustine and in Caribbean islands, uh, which is the uh, street front and courtyard house, uh, a village off a core golf course. Uh, and some of the early drawings that showed the intention for East West Street uh, to, sh to be shaded by buildings uh, and what it looks like as it's going up, uh, and how some of the building types look as you draw inside your courtyard house, uh, uh, which is clearly a very high end, and some of those intentions intended to be a high end um, project, uh, but which represents a breakthrough because this is where the marketing people said. <coughs> You will never convince people uh, who are going to spend more than a million dollars on for a house that they should live in anything less than 10 or 15,000 square feet of land. Uh, and here, the these lots are six and seven thousand square feet. So it's very important to set up a kind of a social prototype in which um, um, that the large house on the lawn with the space around it uh, is not the only prototype um, uh, for any kind of income. Um, but most of that is about housing. Uh, the question always comes up about the commercial prototype. Uh, in this project for 10,000 acres, it's now cut down to five, uh, thanks to the state's purchase of Sensitive Lands. Um, uh, there's an idea uh, about different types of commercial centers, uh, which uh, are connected by <coughs> what can be a transportation loop, a series of towns, town centers, small villages, um, in an environment in which over 50% of the land is given away um, to environmental, um, uh, an open environment uh, with a high degree of continuity, um, particularly respectful uh, of habitat requirements. And of course, you can make the town center like the one we illustrated on the, uh, on the right, uh, but you can also look to some of the very standard commercial development prototypes like the mall or the corner shopping center and begin to reform them without large, greatly changing uh, the conventions uh, that tenants require, uh, such as highway visibility uh, for the large box stores <coughs> or lots of physical park parking on the highway. Uh, but you can connect the large stores and the mall uh, and the ubiquitous, ubiquitous area uh, back to a main street, which might have a mix of office buildings apartments, which usually cluster around malls, uh, and eventually connect back into residential neighborhoods behind. Just like the public and the Eckerd uh, and the thousand feet of small store in between uh, can be remade with highway visibility and parking out front, um, shops or offices above, uh, more parking behind, and connections back to the residential community behind them. You can do the same for the smallest shopping center uh, and even for the 7-Eleven or the first <coughs> um, And some of these ideas, of course, are being worked on in various situations, like at the University of Miami, uh, where a series of projects after the hurricane took a look at an existing neighborhood with a corner shopping center um, disconnected from the neighborhood. Uh, and this drawing shows how, with very little work, just rebuilding most of the stores and houses and kind of making a few connections back into the neighborhood, you can begin to change um, the existing aspects of it. That slide is highlighted, I'm sorry, but that's okay. Um, and this is being done successfully, not just in drawings, but not just shown in New England, with a 1950s shopping center. Um, no, this slide is right, I'm sorry. Which looks, uh, which you see looking from this circle, this is called uh, Mashpee Common, and that shopping remade uh, into a town center with an intersection of Main and Market Streets. The same supermarket is still here, and many of the same tenants which just moved around. Uh, it connects to a town green and a church, which like that pool I showed you earlier, bought a piece of property along the highway, um, took its plans, and discovered that this was happening, and turned them around just prior to 
construction that is the church now and Main Street uh, and will take to the green. Nashley Commons is continuing to build, which is <coughs> uh, <coughs> with uh, a good deal of market success that can keep building um, in Cape Cod in a climate in which nothing else really has been progressing. Um, so those examples might be that third tier of city, uh, which I call the outer suburb, in which much of the housing stock is in pretty good uh, condition. And the main area that you can work in are places like shopping centers. Um, that's true of the inner suburbs as well. And I think um, these are worth calling attention to because we have some here in South Florida. Um, I don't know Broward that well, but I know that there are places in Bay County in which there are wonderful residential neighborhoods not very far from the core uh, from the coastal city, uh, which are under great duress. Um, a certain amount of their commercial activity, uh, which since they were designed um, before World War II, uh, which they like now. Okay, growth is kind of an example, the opposite example though. Um, uh, where these residential neighborhoods are under the under duress in some because of regional development. Uh, very often they find that their old strip commercial uh, uh, is beginning to empty out uh, as stores move to the mall on the new edge. Uh, and uh, the, then the residential neighborhoods that, be, that are behind them are under duress because the heart of the community is being destroyed. Sometimes it has a lot to do with the big, with the road being large and steep. Uh, and we don't, we're not recognizing that these are the places need the careful infill uh, and the protection uh, to ensure their future viability and to ensure that they don't become devalued and that we don't also dispose of those neighborhoods as we did of the ones in the poor city. Uh, there's no kind of government program for anybody, uh, any entity that's looking at how to help those places. They're not when they're part of a large municipality uh, who's not attempting to them either because they're not yet in crisis, but they will be. Mysore Park here in, in Boca Raton, of course, um, uh, is very advanced in the fact that it did take a look at one of these <coughs> shopping centers um, uh, near the older neighborhoods of Boca Raton uh, and began with this new redevelopment. Um, uh, think of how to reconstruct the new core for that community. <coughs> uh, and finally, the core city, which we've been working on for many years throughout the United States. This is a picture of Clavat Street. Uh, at West Palm Beach. Uh, it's something that we're learning about how to work with better uh, all the time. These people are taking back their main street, um, which is coming back if any of you have been there recently. But probably the most uh, uh, intractable aspect of these places, including in West Palm, um, is the residential neighborhood and bringing residents back to places that have been cleared out. And this is an example from Cleveland. <coughs> The way the neighborhood looks clearly has been a place of sidewalks, um, uh, trees, and houses, and it no longer is, but a few of them are still there. Um, and it's very hard to bring investors back into these places or buyers. Uh, in this case, there have been some attempts made with suburban houses, as you see on the left, and the Habitat Project, um, not the people on the right. Um, and we made a proposal which said you must not devalue those prior to efforts. Um, so we said we would take, we would uh, design one model of a tall house that would look like the old building and something that would be shorter in front uh, to go with the new one. Because uh, what we cannot continue doing in that situation is coming in with their fourth generation, uh, which says the prior efforts aren't worth anything. Uh, you really have to think about that as a kind of infill. Situation in which you have to revalue everything that's been done up to now because you can't afford to dispose of it. And just a few more pictures. Um, we discovered that there was some correcting that needed to be done to the street grid in which the streets were continuous, thousand feet long. So they really didn't conform to those neighborhood principles that I described earlier. And these cross streets with the green focusing on this church. Uh, which you see sitting out there by itself, uh, and these small <coughs> and another small cross lane uh, were added in order to bring this community together um, and 
how all of these houses might add up to a two street coming in focusing on the church and one of the first houses um, to be built and was a successful revival um, and it's all made of vinyl too. Uh, and finally when you get to the center part of the city I think you shine this slide that's full of parking lots that are too high rise and then we know that slide from West Palm or downtown Miami or even parts of Fort Lauderdale. Um, one of the things that needs to be done is to bring back uh, once again um, uh, some concept of physical predictability uh, to dislodge the log dam um, of speculation and investor insecurity. Uh, this is a drawing of downtown LA and a strategic plan um, to the bunker hill, which proposed um, that once again, instead of FARs and also all sorts of negotiated zoning, uh, one might be very specific um, uh, in a, a much more sophisticated version of that piece that I propose uh, of precisely how tall buildings are allowed to be, um, how they may be entered by vehicles, uh, how they relate to each other. Now, um, the last few minutes of this talk are going to be spent on implementation. Um, I think tonight you will hear a more critical stance from the Lani about the current situation and how we're not doing anything enough for it. Um, but I'd like to uh, take the high road, so to speak, and tell you about a few things that are happening that could be taken advantage of more than they are here in South Florida. Uh, because the lost strides have already been made. Uh, and there may be just a few more things that need to be done to make these uh, moves more effective than they have been up to now. Uh, and the first I'd like to talk about is the traditional neighborhood district ordinance, um, which is shown here in its matrix format. It was passed by Dade County and Palm Beach County and has not yet been used. Um, however, it's been um, used in many other parts of the country, either in pieces or whole, as it gets incorporated in zoning ordinances. And a very important project Los Angeles called Playa Vista uh, is going forward with small turning radii uh, on its traditional intersections uh, thanks to the fact that the Dade County Commission passed this code with 15 foot intersection radii. Um, the City Council in Los Angeles has thought that as long as somebody else in the country has done it, they could do it too. So mm -hmm. even though we haven't used it here, uh, it's something in other places. And of course, uh, the big green book, the ITE manual, uh, now has uh, a section which deals with traditional neighborhood design. Uh, in South mm -hmm. Dade, after the hurricane, um, a number of things are going forward, including um, the county passed the Redland Plan, uh, which speaks to conservation of farmland uh, and has some very strict coding to uh, encourage, in fact, the imagery of the farmland uh, with new landscape regulations and new building design regulations, which are intended to have that the economic component uh, of making this place very appealing for visitors so that uh, farming as a business uh, mm. and as a tourist business as well uh, can, can thrive. Uh, and near there uh, is a very exciting project in which Habitat, um, that's the model on the right, uh, in which Habitat is going to be building 200 homes on 40 acres uh, according to the principles of uh, traditional neighborhood design, uh, <clears throat> the community center and smaller neighborhood greens. Uh, and it doesn't show very well here, uh, but a corner recreational area, some playing fields that connect to um, water management canals, uh, which of course Sam Williams is studying uh, how to regenerate those in a natural way. Uh, and the hope is that um, a project such as, as this uh, and a prototype of the wind study might someday come together to show how this future begins to work together, uh, even though the initiatives um, have different purposes. Um, and just two closing slides uh, of uh, some things that I know we've been working on in South Florida, um, the kind of greenways, uh, which are real win-win items apparently. They're moving forward very quickly throughout the state and throughout the country. These began a European shop. I know I promised I would show you for a minute, but uh, this is a bicycle path uh, on a busy six lane street um, in Berlin. And this could be Kendall Drive. It has more or less the same median, the same number of lists. I guess that should be saying University Drive. Um, and it just has a slightly wider right of way uh, for bicycle and pedestrian more trees uh, in order to make this a truly civilized street. Uh, and I think that we could see uh, quite easily commuting to work or to shopping on a 
bicycle path like that, where we could never envision it on one of our own streets here in South Florida. Um, and here's a greenway along the canal, uh, which instead of being merely a utility device, uh, has become an important component uh, at the heart of the community. Uh, here are shops, um, no doubt you walk across here to the residential area uh, and see what it does for the people who live there. Uh, so, building on some of these ideas on some of the successes uh, that we have in this country, and perhaps even some of the academic ideas uh, we've already explored, uh, for instance, with the bird drive basin um, study many years ago, uh, looking at the eastern, excuse me, the western edge of Dade County. Um, hopefully, we can produce something for you in the next couple of days um, that are truly worthwhile. We have time for a few more minutes on in, uh, implementation, or should we stop? Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. The first person that said no, I'm going to stop. <laughs> uh, so, I think this uh, designer's perspective shows that there are clearly interesting um, and beautiful strategies for building and rebuilding communities. Um, it remains then to review some of the implications for implementation. Uh, and this is going to be a series of uh, policy suggestions, not setting aside another topic, or in fact setting aside another topic, management, because I think all of these issues cannot come to be uh, and in fact, some of the proposed city problems in here have bad on the management. Uh, but we know that clean and safe is the first issue, and so we're just going to set that aside uh, and think about some policies from local, regional, state, and federal perspectives. And I've, I have a long list, but I picked two that I hope would be the most effective in each level. At the municipal and county level, Make the improvement and future quality of the community part of the local public agenda. But the quality of our physical surroundings have a silent, has a silent political pathology, only surfacing in public discussion and outbursts of venom over something go wrong or about to go wrong, almost always perceived to be perpetrated from above. Citizen involvement ahead of crisis in the planning and design of the community's future has been shown to produce positive results, including a reduction in NIMBYism. Uh, and we can look at cities like Indianapolis and San Francisco to show success. Uh, it's no surprise that the Home Air Force Base story keeps going on and on because the residents of that area um, feel they've been left out. Two, at the local level, change the regulatory environment to be simple and clearly prescriptive of the desired results. How many times have people said they don't know what growth management is supposed to look like? Existing zoning ordinances continue to produce bad results, including the isolation of housing type by income, for instance. We should delete requirements for too much parking, for landscape buffers and open space, which are meaningless in the places that they're given and prevent these things from coming together. And we should require the mixing of compatible use of these buildings in close proximity, making neighborhoods rather than subdivisions. Um, one thing we could do very quickly in Dade County, for instance, is make the TMP mandatory for all the land. What little there is left uh, is going to be developed on the west side of the county. Uh, we have a tool right at our hands, and we just stop short of saying we have to do it. Uh, if we said that, it would be just like the housing in Montgomery County. Uh, things would begin to change. Uh, in terms of existing urbanism, um, we should have. The goal should be to consolidate and revalue it, um, require specific design for downtown sites. Don't use the generic zoning codes that we've written. They have generalized setbacks and parking rules. You can't put a restaurant downtown because you don't have any parking. Uh, therefore, there are no restaurants downtown. People can't have to drive out from work to go eat and so on. Rather than devaluing, revalue. Allow non-conforming uses. Uh, and require redevelopment of large tracts, such as shopping centers, which renovate themselves every five or ten years, to compensate for the local need, providing wherever possible a missing community focus for surrounding residents. 
at the metropolitan and the regional scale. Um, I once heard somebody say you should think lo globally, act locally, and regulate regionally. Uh, we need to establish the regional planning, and I should say design effort. The essential goals I think we agree on. These are to identify and protect public conservation areas, farmland, and other low-density privately owned lands for urban space. Protect and support historic neighborhoods, as well as existing commercial centers which serve them. Specify those areas where new urban centers are to be built or reinforced. Uh, this is a, a, a zoning problem or a planning for land use problem, I guess. Uh, it's been acknowledged that we have more red space on the map in Dade County than we need, and that's one of the things that promotes the disposability of uh, commercial areas. Promote a long term transportation plan which coordinates local land use and regional transit planning. This effort should go as far as to develop detailed plans for development or redevelopment within a half mile radius of any transit station. Merely zoning, as we have seen in Dave Town with Metro Rail, merely zoning for higher density use does not give confidence to early investors and can, cannot ensure development in support of this transit. And then you have the years of subsidy, which people complain about. <coughs> At the state level, require the integration of transportation planning into regional plans. The federally encouraged metropolitan planning organizations are misnamed as they only cover transportation planning. Traffic is perceived to be an autonomous problem of the physical solution instead of as an integral component of land use. I know the Florida DOT is already um, some steps ahead of this. Uh, you have a law which says now that no highway, I believe, can have more than six lanes that are not high occupancy vehicles. And that certainly made the DOT in Miami begin to look at transit very carefully. Uh, however, they can't look outside of their right of ways. Uh, and they have a very arcane way of selecting those right of ways, which does involve pub public process um, that is not as productive as it could be. But they can't determine how the area around that transit will support it. Now, one thing that the, probably kind of most people don't know about that the state, um, at the state level could be very helpful is to change the funding criteria of state programs for affordable and low cost housing development. These, uh, the criteria in these programs often reinforce acknowledged problems um, uh, rather than supporting healthy. Uh, the low priority which is given in those criteria to technical assistance um, therefore does not support and in fact mitigates very directly against site-specific planning and that uh, uh, and promotes cookie cutter building design um, precluding at the same time the infill of existing communities the list of criteria by which developers um, fill out the forms when they bid for for uh, housing funds in the state, uh, in the end, produce a mandate almost uh, for many units of one type on cheap real estate on the urban fringe. Transit jobs and services, therefore, are distant uh, to the people who need, from the people who need them the most, and uh, the single income bulk of this housing precludes this project's integration <laughs> into the system or new community. Even some of the private sector developers who do these house housing funds will tell you they can't build less than 200 at a time and get in uh, under the criteria. At the federal level, finally, um, I hesitate to say establish a mandate, um, but I think you need to do this um, for equal opportunity and the balancing of resources among school systems. Um, this may not be such a problem in South Florida, but it is in other cities where there's disparity between the center city, city and the suburbs. Uh, and that, of course, can affect how the highway lives, and they won't move back down to the town because the schools are bad. Obviously, the federal priority for assisting vehicular transportation um, must be replaced with increased support for public for public transit. Establish federal funding criteria for local transit development to mandate a mix of land uses and pedestrian-friendly urban design at transit stations. Um, that really doesn't cost. And it could filter down from 
through the ST regulations if it were to be incorporated. So the goal of developing a sustainable region must be a part of every South Korean South Korean's life. This is a concept everyone can support. I really believe it in spite of the fact that uh, one of our mayors in Miami told me that we could never get together on this um, because of uh, how many different people there were there. It's not merely an issue of aesthetics or cosmetics. Conserving natural resources while building healthy neighborhoods and cities is an imperative of social, economic, and environmental function, which will ultimately determine our ability to compete with other regions nationally and internationally. Even a short visit to some European cities shows a sharp contrast to the investment priorities and stewardship of the built environment that we pursue in the U.S. Building the future of our country is not yet such an accepted goal uh, as to be cliche. We generally are not thinking in this sense at all. But one can imagine that this is indeed the kind of common goal even the most diverse society can agree on. Here in South Florida, even the new arrivals, who for some elected leaders seem too difficult to engage, can be included in the goal of building environmentally and economically responsible communities for their and our children. Beautiful and functional places are made intentionally, not by words and numbers alone, but by design. Thank you. I'm not sure that it's a form of governance, actually. Um, this is something that Tony Downs addresses in the new book. Um, the title I forget, but I'll find it for you. Um, because um, I think there's a great, especially in this country, there would be a great fear of actually layering on another, yet another layer of government uh, that somehow um, uh, is above or takes um, some of the responsibilities and resources of multiple government, governments. Um, I can think of that certainly for here in South Florida. But there, there is not a clear structure of who's supposed to be in charge of what. Um, very often from municipal and county um, to state government. Uh, some of the issues uh, that I think we're contending with in Bay County now are of um, secession and incorporation. Um, there, I think there's some large number of like these communities which are ready to Incorporated in Dane County because they don't see the county as really providing them any useful services they need. Um, so it may be a kind of restructuring in which um, some of these responsibilities are sorted out uh, a little bit more clearly. But I think probably the most productive um, kind of work or product uh, would be if everyone really shared some picture of how they were going to be going forward and really in a point of working on this within their own jurisdictions. I think that piece that Ben Sarah wrote um, is really wonderful because if, if everybody could buy into that and say, yes, this is the goal, and then start looking at things like the TMD or the IT standards and say, yes, these are the tools um, to get there. And everyone at whatever level, whether it's the functionary in the planning department or the county manager would be thinking in those terms as kind of whole to all the other issues. So this is not a very clear answer because I don't think there's a clear one clear road forward. Um, but I'm pretty sure it's not about a new form, a new overlay of government. Yeah. Okay. You said you're talking about a regional uh, planning and design effort. What was the well, I think we've got one here. Uh, with a thousand friends in Florida and the water management district working together, two entities that have a regional overview, um, uh, with the municipalities participating, that's one way to do it. 
there should be in the next couple of days, I mean, where there should be some sort of regional entity um, that may have more control, but mostly around the country has pretty great view. That's why um, <coughs> I'll be great. <laughs> are, are you about to uh, be able to do the uh, stage recording on the project? Are we about to do it? There are a couple of wait a couple of waiting in the wings. Um, and uh, later on, uh, Joe Cole and Victor Dover will tell you that um, some may have worked on their waiting. But we discovered we did two things wrong with it. Um, one is that we didn't realize um, how many developers in Dade County come in with five and ten acre tracks. Um, yeah, and we set it at 40 because in order to have a mix of uses and types, what you would need to do is require that somebody be coming in with a small acreage uh, and have to provide plans also for the area around and to get together with the neighbors around. Um, in Broward, the area that we're in is developing a large tract. Uh, so I think we can apply the principles directly um, uh, and show how something like Bonaventure could be done in a different pattern that would be more supportive of all of the um, And the other thing was that the planning staff was so excited about the code and participated in this process um, that everything was layered into it. Everybody's highest hopes of a great place were added to it. Uh, in, and, a complex review process added part of that. Um, so it's more complicated to use right now than it's supposed to be. Yeah. So, um, but I think that no matter how, if it could be simplified and um, if we saw that it or some version of it um, um, could be used in the little land that we left, we could begin to reverse and even affect possibly with some of the inland. Yeah. Yeah. Tony Downs' book is called New Visions for Urban America, uh, available from uh, Brookings uh, Institute and Lincoln Land Institute. Um, and I guess he is trying to uh, um, attack the same problems you're trying to attack, but from the perspective of an economist, uh, looking at the underlying economic forces that produce what's been produced. Um, and it uh, looks like uh, two disciplines going at the same results in different directions. Uh, there's a there is a group of people who um, have come together from uh, ranging from inner city CBCs to um, some of the most elite environmental groups um, on a national scale, which will be meeting in San Francisco in two weeks um, as the third session of Congress for New Urbanism. And as far as we know, that's the first time that we have kind of um, uh, down and dirty community activists who are concerned about social issues meeting with people who have the kind of national scope of buying land and preserving um, beautiful places uh, to talk about how these issues are complementary and, and how the region is the matrix for their well-being that you will never stop encroaching on open space unless you improve the conditions down there. Yeah. I'm
Uh, well, in fact, I would propose that a blend is not the answer. Um, that we should accept that we have um, a certain convention of buildings uh, in the suburbs or outside the city, which your project represents, um, uh, which certainly along with all, I think, um, the beginning of all of the development had very good intentions. Uh, and there are a lot of people who uh, really want to live that way, so we're not going to say you can't do that. And I think we're not suggesting that people go out of the way about space uh, and uh, devalue what, what you're doing. But the fact of the matter is that I think statistically we can look at, um, especially with regard to things like traffic congestion um, and the fact that transit is not viable, people are feeling that. And uh, lots of other things in terms of mixing incomes, which are difficult for projects like yours to do. Um, and say that, well, when you look at the region, we really got a lot of that out of um, And um, that's all that's available because that's what the regulation of temporary CDC and marketing studies for that matter. Marketing studies don't look at Lake Forest uh, or Miami Beach or any of the other wonderful um, traditional communities and tell you that that's worth doing. They, so they're always leaving you to do the same thing over and over again. And we've got that, we have enough of that, I guess is what I'm saying. And that we need to go on to this other pattern, which will take care of things like um, the continuity of open space for habitat, um, take care of traffic congestion, uh, promote transit, social integration, and all the things that I talked about. So let's not blend it because you're not going to get either a good model of what you've been doing or a good model that addresses these other problems. Um, they can coexist, but they should coexist in their pure model. What would the uh, Department of Defense take? And uh, I heard a couple of stickers. So. <laughs> okay, so I try not to beat up on anybody too bad today. There was an article, uh, as I recall, reading uh, in the last week in Sun Sentinel that talked about decline in uh, uh, multiple occupancy vehicles <coughs> nationwide and also in South Florida in the last 10 years. And, that's, and it was also a criticism of, uh, of the Department of Transportation for continuing to promote high occupancy vehicle lanes, spend our money in that manner. I also recall some years ago, Ronald Reagan attacking uh, Metro Rail as being could have put all these people in limousines cheaper. For a while. For a while. Well, he didn't go for a while. But as the department tries to promote progressive policies, uh, we can't do that in a vacuum. And I don't believe that the department can be the driving force or the leader in changing land development. You're familiar, you already referred to it, what our planning process is for transportation. And we are believed, we are in fact reactionary. That may not be desirable, but that's the situation, that's the way it's set up. We have to react to land development patterns and plans of local government. Uh, I think that the department would be pleased to come forward with different methods of transportation, but they have to work for what local government is planning to do. You know, you're making me think that um, perhaps we answer, or one answer to consider for um, Paul's question is that, uh, which I mentioned, the, the Metropolitan Planning Organization or the Regional Planning Council, which are entities which are already in place and could promote um, this kind of common effort, um, really could ameliorate your situation uh, as well as have a number of agencies working together. I, I'm pretty sure that in Dade County, um, the DOT plans that you carry out as consultants um, are not done with great communication through the thought of the planning department. Um, that I, don't, I don't know which point the interface, but that interface would probably be a lot better. Um, yeah. I, two things. One is bad news, and then uh, we have to just make it to the room by five o'clock. Uh, and I apologize to you. But what we, we do have another thing we're going to be doing uh, the workshop tomorrow, and, and maybe. Uh, we can continue uh, with the video design. 
part of uh, from what uh, our interest in having this is a very spot when to get in a little bit. This is the same in South Florida. Uh, some of these rumors is this lady is part of the thing. But I think it's uh, how we deal with that way is to get people back into the world. It's like a small thing. Uh, it's going to depend on how we do it. Yeah. <laughs> 